Uh, welcome everybody uh, to our discussion of political and security dynamics in the Horn of Africa. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mark Stout. I'm the director of the MA in Global Security Studies here at Johns Hopkins Advanced Academic Programs. We are, we are very fortunate to have with us today an alumni, an alum, and I never know the proper Latin there, I apologize, of the MA in Global Security Studies, uh, Mark Munson, uh, to speak with us. Uh, Mark uh, is actually a naval officer. Uh, he became a surface warfare officer in 2011 uh, when he graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy at Annapolis. He spent uh, six years on active duty and then joined the Navy Reserves. Around about the time he was joining the Reserves, he entered the MA in Global Security Studies here at Johns Hopkins AAP. And uh, he, he wrote his research study at the end on complexity and the forecasting of event of forecasting events, uh, particularly in an intelligence analysis context, um, events like the Arab Spring. Uh, he graduated at the end of the spring 2019 semester. And then during a recently completed deployment to Djibouti in Africa, uh, Mark was assigned to the combined joint, combined joint Task Force Horn of Africa and served in the Future Operations Mission Planning Cell. So that's the context of his uh, discussion with us today about the Horn of Africa, its issues and its importance. Uh, so Mark, we're really delighted to have you here. Thank you so much for coming back, uh, albeit only virtually and sharing your insights with us. I, I look forward to a, a great discussion and uh, the floor is yours. Well, good evening and thank you, Professor Stout for the kind introduction. I, before I begin, I wish to express my thanks to Tasha for organizing the event, Professor Stout for thinking my initial proposal was a good idea, and to the audience for taking the time out of your day to listen to what I have to say. Before I begin, I'm obliged to give the usual disclaimer. The opinions and assertions expressed herein are those of the presenter myself and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the Department of Defense, the Department of the Navy, or any other part of the federal government. Here's just a brief itemized list of the agenda I intend to cover. Professional background, Professor Stout covered the gist of it, but two points I wanted to point out. I've been to the Horn of Africa twice. My first tour of the USS Mesa Verde, that's the vessel on the top right there, an amphibious transport dock. We did counter piracy operations in the vicinity of the Gulf of Aden, which is the body of water immediately to the south of the Red Sea and uh, on the western edge of the Indian Ocean. And in this recent deployment, as previously mentioned, I was assigned to the Combined Joint Task Force Horn of Africa in Camp Lemonet, Djibouti. Uh, I was there from November of last year. I just got back in August. The picture on the bottom uh, is a picture from 2012 of Camp Lemonet. Later on in the presentation, I have a a updated picture so you could see uh, the change over the years and how much it's expanded. Just for your information, the orientation of this picture, the cameraman, his, his back is to the water. And when I show you that new picture, you'll see it's expanded a whole lot into the ocean. So when I talk to people about Africa, I always like to talk about the size. Africa is huge. I like this graphic because it not only visually demonstrates the geographic size of Africa, but also provides numerical area of each country as well. So you have those two points of comparison. You can see in the graphic there, United States, China, India, Europe, Japan, all fit very comfortably in Africa. And there's a reason for this. <laughs> One of the more popular maps of the modern era is the Mercator projection. Many of you have probably seen this. And unfortunately, and in my case included, I was not fully aware of just how large Africa was. So we, we look at this map and it distorts our view of how large countries really are. Because what happens is, as you move in latitude north or south of the equator, the geography is stretched. And so the result is that countries at high, higher latitudes look much larger than they really are, like Antarctica or Greenland, whereas most of Africa is at or near the equator. 
so the distortion does not inflict it as much as other states. The geography of Africa and lack of infrastructure gives rise to a concept called the tyranny of distance, which means that large geographic distances impose constraints on mobility. The image on the right is, as you probably guessed, Somalia superimposed on the east coast of the United States. The total coastline of Somalia is larger than the total coastline of the east coast. Imagine Somalia cut in half and conducting a counterinsurgency in the bottom half. The bottom half is where most of the current activity is. That's still a lot of area to cover. If you look on that image there, it's basically from the Virginias all the way down to Alabama. And it's important to keep these facts in mind. Impose, trying to impose our will over large geographic areas without proper commitment can be extremely difficult. So why Djibouti? The strategic significance of Djibouti was always about its position in relation to the maritime domain. Even though today it is part of the US Africa Command, it should be viewed as on the western edge of the Indian Ocean. You can see the image on the bottom right, most of Djibouti's historic trade routes are operating in the Indian Ocean. And as with most areas of the world, the strategic significance of the Horn of Africa has been sinusoidal, peaking at certain times and plummeting at other times. First gained significance after the construction of the Suez Canal. As you can guess, that brought a bunch of European powers uh, to become interested in the area, primarily France and Britain. And Djibouti was the French Somaliland land uh, before it became independent in 1977. And then of course, Cold War dynamic kept the area significantly important. And in 1983, the US Central Command was established. Uh, and I, there's an image later on that you'll see the pre-2008 AOR, which includes Sudan, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Djibouti, Kenya, and Somalia. And then and after the Cold War and after the first Gulf War, uh, the primary focus of the Central Command was Iran and Iraq. Uh, obviously, Gulf War, uh, we repulsed Saddam, and then it was a continual Northern Southern Watch and Iran has been a continual concern of the military for a long time. So it lost, it was kind of crowded out a little bit. But then starting after 9-11, the area started to gain more significance in the eyes of the US. The US uh, initially established uh, an expeditionary base to support the global war on terror efforts. Um, but in recent days, as more and more people have realized that history has not ended and that there has always been great power competition, that uh, that area is growing more and more uh, crowded and gaining in significance. So this list, uh, the many geopolitical layers of their region is not meant to be uh, all inclusive, I couldn't, I have to spend days to uh, uh, fully in detail describe everything. Plus I probably can't because I'm not an expert, um, but it's merely to provide the sense that it is in a multipolar region with many different powers competing for advantage. Uh, so I'll begin with the first bullet, the US-China dynamic and potential for greater Russia involvement. Many aspects of this relationship. Uh, one you may be familiar with is the US effort to prevent the spread of Huawei and the 5G company. And there's been a lot of press play between the US and its Western allies, uh, but it's also been a key issue in uh, the Horn, East Africa. Uh, a lot of the governments try and, and balance and, and not 
make it obvious that they favor one side or the other. For example, the Kenyan government has already come out and said that it would not pressure Safaricom, which is its primary tech company, not to use Huawei, but leave it up to the company. <laughs> There's also competition emerging uh, to influence the emerging space economies. For example, the Ethiopian Space Science and Technology Institute, the equivalent of NASA, in early October confirmed that it will launch a nano satellite in December on board a Chinese rocket from China. It will be Ethiopia's second satellite. The first one was launched again from China in December of 2019. Another aspect is people uh, refer to as the Chinese debt trap. Others refer to it as China's reverse Hong Kong strategy, where China will forgive unpayable debt to get a 99 year concession or some X year concession, similar to what, uh, what the United Kingdom did to the UK or to, the, to Hong Kong. Uh, one estimate I saw by 2021, Djibouti's debt to China will increase to 60.7% of its GDP. Uh, also in Kenya, port, the port of Mombasa is held by China as collateral. And if Kenya defaults on its loans, while China builds a standard uh, gauge railway uh, from Mombasa to Nairobi. And the second bullet there, the essentially the VEO aspect, the US Somali Amazon efforts against primarily Al Shabaab, but also uh, tertiary efforts against Al Qaeda and ISIS in uh, the Horn of Africa. For those who aren't familiar, the African Union mission in Somalia. AMISOM is an active regional peacekeeping mission operated by the African Union with the approval of the United Nations. Its current mandate expires December 2021. Uh, there are many, many challenges to meet that deadline. Uh, it has been extended numerous times over the years. And there are AMISOM participants who have been accused of pursuing their own interests, uh, notably Kenya and Ethiopia. Kenya allegedly, uh, there has been accusations that they're trying to create a, their own buffer state in the southern Somali regional state, Jubaland. Uh, and they've, the president of that state, President Madobi, uh, part of the allegation is that he's an ally of Kenya and they're working together, violating the sovereignty of Somalia. <laughs> there are, there are, other issues uh, there, such as there was a new, a recent uh, UNSC report that claims Al-Shabaab exploits the Somali real estate market and has upwards of $13 million invested. And the report claims that Al-Shabaab manages the money better than the Somali government. The third uh, layer there, account of piracy, uh, the European Union, Union Naval Forces has since 2008 conducted its Operation Atalanta, which among other objectives, uh, they deter, prevent, repress piracy, armed robbery at sea, monitor fishing activities off the coast of Somalia, supports other EU missions and inter international organizations work in the strength in maritime security and capacity in the region. Combined Task Force 150 and 151 are US versions of Atalanta. China has also conducted naval uh, uh, escorts, um, which have included taking port calls into countries such as Mozambique. The fourth bullet, the Gulf Interrivalry, which usually takes the form of the United Arab Emirates and or Saudi Arabia, working against the efforts of Qatar and sometimes by extension Turkey. And the Arab Sprit split that occurred years ago uh, is unfolding on the continent in uh, multiple ways. <clears throat> the fifth bullet, numerous allies and coalition partners operating on the continent. <laughs> Aside from the US, 
The second largest is France, the French forces uh, Djibouti. And the presence of French forces on the Djibouti territory is framed by the Defense Cooperation Treaty signed December 2011 between Djibouti and France. And the French forces staged in Djibouti constitute the largest contingent of French present forces in Africa and one of the two forward operating bases on the continent. With nearly 1,500 soldiers deployed. The sixth bullet has made the headlines uh, a couple times recently is the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam dispute between primarily Ethiopia and Egypt, but also Sudan and South Sudan are involved too. The Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam was bu is built on the Blue Nile, the main tributary that feeds into the Nile River on the Ethiopian side. There's a lot of history to this conflict. Basically, Egypt wants to retain what it, it calls its historic right to the Nile River based on decades old treaties. Ethiopia, now a power itself, wants to harness the river for internal development. And Egypt is afraid of potential water security implications. And then the Sudans are caught in between both powers. In my opinion, just because they are upstream and they are more powerful than they were in the past, Ethiopia has the advantage. The GERD is already built and water is being filled in the reservoir. Egypt has even threatened to attack the dam, but so far it has only been rhetoric. China has generally supported Ethiopia and the US has supported Egypt. That bottom bullet there, I have a slide dedicated to it because I think it's the most interesting and potentially the one item in the future that could uh, prove to be most significant. Basically, uh, since early to the middle of the year, Somaliland which is a, a federal member of the state. Somalia claims it's part of Somalia, but Somali land claims it's an independent state. And recently, Somaliland and Taiwan established diplomatic relations and they opened representative offices in each respective country. Naturally, China and Somalia do not like this. China, uh, reiterated its support for Somalia's territorial integrity and Somalia, the president of Somalia, re reiterated support for the one China policy. And as this has progressed, the sides are slowly solidifying. So Somalia and Taiwan, their uh, relations are growing tighter and tighter and you can see that kind of a similar track with China and Somalia. This current development is really significant for both countries, but specifically Taiwan. And just to convey the significance, I found a quote that I really like. Um, it's from Robert Gates' recent book, Exercise of Power. The Chinese do impose their own conditions on potential recipients. According to aid data, countries that consistently vote with China in the UN General Assembly are more likely to get higher levels of aid and investment. China also insists that recipients of its investment recognize the one China policy and cut all ties with Taiwan. In 2008, the Chinese conducted Costa Rica, induced Costa Rica to take such an action by tying it to the purchase of 300 million in Costa Rica bonds. Within five years of China's earliest investments in Africa, the number of African governments recognizing Taiwan fell from 13, roughly half of all states to recognize Taipei globally to four. So that's fell from 13 to four. And so this new relationship is a, a big win for Taiwan. Okay, moving on from the the politics, I'm gonna go into uh, some uh, organizational discussion of the US military on the continent. So as previously mentioned, 2008, 
AFRICOM was carved out of the European Command and Central Command. You can see that on the left. And in the most recent COCOM border delineation on the right, Africa minus Egypt, Egypt remained with Central Command. Just, and these are just the various entities of AFRICOM. The HQ AFRICOM, obviously on top, headed by a four-star General Townsend, U.S. Army General. And in the various service components, U.S. Naval Forces Europe and Africa, that admiral is actually dual-hatted, so he, he uh, is in command of Naval Forces Europe and Africa. U.S. Air Forces Africa, U.S. Army Africa, U.S. Marine Corps Forces Africa, and then Special Operations Command Africa, and then uh, the command I was assigned to, the Combined Joint Task Force Horn of Africa, and they all report directly up to AFRICOM HQ. So here's a Google Maps snapshot of Djibouti City uh, with the what's called the Djibouti Base Cluster, which is composed of Camp Lemonade, Shabeli Airfield, and the Port of Djibouti. I've also highlighted the Chinese Naval Logistics Base on the northwestern edge, just for uh, your situational awareness. <laughs> and if you recall that initial picture of Camp Lemonet from that was taken from 2012, the end of the camp ended right about right here where the mouse is. And then since then, there's been this expansion all the way east to the water. So to provide some background on how the Department of Defense produces um, strategic documents. Uh, you've probably heard of the National Security Strategy. That's the overall arching document of the United States produced by the White House. And then out of that, the Pentagon produces the National Defense Strategy. And then out of that, the Joint Chiefs produce the National Military Strategy. And in each combatant command is tasked to produce a campaign plan, and that essentially uh, delineates how they're going to fulfill those objectives outlined in those strategic documents. And then each subordinate command component, they produce a campaign support plan, which is nested under the combatant command campaign plan. And so what this slide is, is obviously unclassified version of uh, CJTF HOA's campaign support plan. And so there's four key pillars called lines of effort, crisis response. Uh, just for example, in around March of 2019, there was um, a big humanitarian disaster in Mozambique. Uh, I, I can't remember if it was like a tsunami or an earthquake or something, but uh, there was a big uh, need and CJTF HOA played a big role in providing relief services to those uh, citizens in need. And then number two, protect US forces. Number three, support operations in East Africa. And number four, uh, uh, maintain strategic partnership in Djibouti. The last uh, comment I'd like to make about uh, the organization on the continent, you may have heard of this, all the combat commands are going through what's called a blank slate review. It's essentially an effort led by the uh, Secretary of Defense to reassess the United States defense posture across the entire defense enterprise and to reassess uh, to see if there's any inefficiencies or to uh, better reallocate assets. AFRICOM was the first one to go through it. They're expected to finish pretty soon. Uh, there has been some press banter about things that may or may not happen, uh, possible uh, uh, things that uh, are the relocation of the AFRICOM HQ from Germany. Uh, they've already come out and said they're not moving the HQ to the African continent. So that means this, if it moves, it might go somewhere else in Europe or possibly somewhere in the United States. 
and then there's also been uh, discussion. Uh, Pentagon officials have been uh, discussing with the press about possible defense posture cuts in West Africa. So there's been a couple uh, significant events in the, in the past year or so. In September of 2019, the end of September of last year, uh, Baladogle Military Airfield, which is slightly northwest of Mogadishu and where uh, significant uh, Amasam effort emanates from, was attacked. There was a uh, vehicle-borne IED. Uh, Al-Shabaab attempted to breach the perimeter with the vehicle-borne IED, but failed, and they were repulsed by security forces. There were no U.S. casualties. And then perhaps the more well-known incident happened in the beginning of the year in January, where a contingency location in Kenya, Manda Bay, was attacked. This was much more sophisticated than the previous attack at uh, Baladogwe. There was a multi-pronged attack on a Kenyan base where U.S. forces resided, aircraft were destroyed, soldiers were injured, and even one U.S. soldier was killed. And so about a month after that, there was what's called a bomber task force, which is essentially a B-52 B was sent out to fly over Somalia. Uh, this picture was taken, uh, the individual who took this picture reportedly was in Southern Somalia uh, by the city of Kismayo and took the picture of the B-52 flying over. It's, it's essentially like, if you've heard of a FANOP, a Freedom of Navigation Operation, uh, what's highly publicized in the South China Sea uh, for the US to flex its muscles and say, uh, this is what we can do to you, basically. And so that's the kind of effect uh, I believe they're trying to get uh, with this bomber task force. One of the things uh, I learned a lot when I was uh, with the task force is how significantly reliant we were on the State Department uh, because it's not a combat zone like Iraq or Afghanistan. The US military doesn't have the free reign and rightfully so uh, on the African continent and anything that we do, there has to be close coordination with the State Department um, so that you know objectives are aligned and you know, people aren't working at cross purposes. And there was, uh, when I had the opportunity to travel to the Nairobi embassy. Uh, and that's of course the embassy that was attacked in 1998 by Osama bin Laden. So that was an interesting experience uh, early in the year. And one of the things I learned by closely working with the State Department is that the State Department has strategic documents. So there's a lot of ink spent by analysts writing about the national security strategy, the national defense strategy, uh, those more defense related documents. Uh, and I think I would consider myself someone who kind of pays attention to those kinds of things. And I had never seen any discussion uh, about anything that the State Department produced. And it wasn't until I, I got in this command and I started talking with the employees and they're like, hey, yeah, we got this stuff, read it. Um, and I did, and it's, I, I'm very surprised I didn't uh, have that opportunity before. And this is all open source. You can just Google it and you, you'll get it on the State Department's way, uh, page. But essentially there's what's called an integrated country strategy and they have one for each country. And then it has, they have a joint regional strategy broken down into uh, regions. And then they have a joint strategic plan, the joint being State Department and USAID. And that's the equivalent of the De Defense Department's national defense strategy. So these documents exist and they're very informative. So I'd like to wrap it up with uh, just a comment about new sources. I uh, it took me a while to find the right ones as I 
first got over there, but I quickly settled upon a handful. These are the, the sources I like, and they're all, as far as I know, I think with the exception of the China Africa project, they're all based out of Africa. So they're Africa news sources. They, I'm, I'm not smart, so I only know English. And so they, they produce most, most of the stuff is in English. So you don't have to worry about the language barrier. All of these are great. And uh, I still continue to re, uh, refer to them for to stay up on the current events. And I, I offer that to you. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Mark Munson, uh, for this. This has been uh, fascinating. I, I know I speak for myself and I'm sure I speak for everyone else who, who came uh, today as well. Uh, as I mentioned, this is not a region I know a lot, of, a lot about and I, I feel like I'm, uh, I'm uh, uh, a whole lot smarter than I, than I was an hour ago. And uh, this has been really interesting. So thank you so much for, for doing this. It's always great to, to see uh, you know, old friends again and see uh, alumni going forth and doing great things. So uh, we really appreciate it and, and, and all the best to you. Thank you all for attending. See you later. Thank you.